I think I got it now. Okay, cool. Um, oh, yeah, I can see it on YouTube now. You can see it? Okay, yes. great. Yes, it's already live. Okay. Okay, cool. All right, so then let's start. Um, so apologies for the delay, everyone. Uh, it took a while to uh, get the streaming up, but I guess we're here and ready to go. Um, so uh, my name is Angela Yao, and I'm an assistant professor at the National University of Singapore. Um, I'm one of the co-organizers of this uh, 3D geometric vision seminar. And it is my great pleasure today to introduce uh, Gim Hee Lee. So Gim Hee Lee is actually my colleague here at, uh, in the Department of Computer Science at NUS. And previously he was a researcher at uh, Mitsubishi Electric Research Labs before joining NUS. Uh, his PhD is uh, in computer science from ETH Zurich. And uh, so for the past, uh, Decade or so, Gim Hee has been working on multi-view geometry uh, for 3D mapping and also localization for autonomous vehicles and also for drones. And in the uh, more recent years, he's been also working on deep learning for uh, 3D computer vision related tasks. So tasks like 3D scene understanding and also uh, human pose estimation. And so in our seminar series today, Gim Hee is going to talk about uh, his works on um, non-strongly supervised uh, learning for 3D vision. So with that, I would like to uh, hand over the stage to Gimhee. Uh, please uh, feel free to start whenever you're ready. Okay, sure, sure. I will share my screen. So can you see the slides? Uh, I see the slides. Uh, I need to open the stream maybe. Okay, good. Uh, I guess I will use the uh, full screen. Okay, great. So uh, thank you, Angela, for the introduction. And uh, as spoken that I will talk about my work on non-strongly supervised learning. Uh, oh, it's on the wrong view, I think. <laughs> but uh, wait, how do I switch this? I think this is in the presenter. Um, um I mean, I see your full slide, give me. Yeah, okay, uh, let me fix this. Uh, to this. Yeah, I think this is better. Okay, uh, I think there's a delay. Okay, uh, so as mentioned that uh, I will talk about the uh, non-strongly supervised learning for uh, 3D vision task and uh, so it's a well-known fact today that uh, everybody is actually working on most of the people uh, in computer vision today. They are working on deep learning related uh, tasks or the, to apply deep learning on many computer vision tasks. And because it has actually achieved a great success over the uh, past few years. However, there's a very big uh, bottleneck uh, in many of these uh, deep learning enabled uh, tasks. And this is the, uh, it's de largely dependent on the availability of uh, strong labels for many, uh, and for many 3D vision tasks, this is actually very difficult to obtain in large uh, quantities. So the uh, solution, which I, we think that uh, should be used to uh, mitigate this uh, uh, bottleneck would be to use non-strongly supervised learning such as uh, self-supervised learning, weekly supervised learning, and semi-supervised learning. Of course, it's not limited to these uh, three techniques. There are several other uh, techniques which can be also uh, classified under non-strongly supervised learning. So uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the 3D computer vision tasks which we try to apply uh, non-strongly supervised learning on. I'll briefly talk about uh, our work on uh, 3D object detection 3D key point detection, as well as uh, 3D semantic segmentation and uh, 3D human pose estimation. So I'll first talk about uh, 3D object detection, uh, which is uh, published in our previous uh, two works in ICCV 19 and CVPR 20. So uh, the, it's the task of 3D object detection on 
RGBD uh, data is uh, defined to be uh, given a 3D point cloud, which uh, looks something can look something like this from an RGBD data or uh, uh, sensor. Uh, the objective here is that we want to uh, take this point cloud together with the RGB information and the, the points information, uh, which is the XYZ, and we want to output the class of the object and place a Titus bounding box around each object in the scene. So <clears throat> they're all together, uh, one classification task that we need to do here, and as well as to do a regression of uh, seven parameters, which is uh, uh, the bounding box parameter around the object. And this is a very uh, laborious and costly uh, task to actually get the strong labels. So imagine that uh, you have to get the uh, labelers the, to manually place all these titles bounding box or and also to identify the objects, the 3D objects that are in the scene given this point cloud here. So it's very difficult to for non-trained eyes to actually uh, even to detect where are these objects and uh, not to even mention to place the bounding boxes correctly around uh, these uh, objects that are in the point cloud. So the uh, in order to mitigate this challenge of the need for strong labels, the main idea here is that uh, in this particular work is that uh, we perform what is known as the cross-category semi-supervised learning for 3D object detection. So the main idea is to transfer knowledge from what we define to be the strong class to the weak class. So strong classes are uh, objects in the uh, in the data sets that we are given with 2D as well as the 3D ground truth. So in this case here, an example would be, uh, let's say I'm, I have chair and beds in my uh, data set, and I'm given the both the 2D and 3D strong labels for these uh, two classes of objects. And I'm going to call this the strong classes. And uh, during training, I won't uh, see the uh, strong labels for the weak classes, such as, for example, uh, the table and the nightstands. I'm only given the 2D labels for these uh, weak classes. But the task here is that I want to train the, the deep network such that on the strong classes as well as the weak classes, such that during inference time, it's also able to predict the 3D bounding boxes of the weak classes that are not seen, the strong labels that are not seen in the during the training. So uh, our proposed method, which we call the transferable semi-supervised uh, 3D object detection from RGBD data was published in ICCB uh, 2019 by my uh, ex-student Yu Xiang over here. And uh, so basically the network uh, consists of a backbone branch over here, which we make use of the state of the art at that time, which was the Froston point net on RGBD uh, data for 3D object detection. And in the in this backbone branch, we will supervise it using the available strong classes. So these are the usual uh, supervision that we give to strongly supervised learning on 3D object detection. Uh, the instance segmentation loss on the uh, Froston point cloud over here. So basically, this is just to mask or whether the point cloud that we get from the Froston is a foreground or a background class. And we will also put the, the 3D bounding boxes uh, I mean, the, the strong loss on the 3D bounding boxes over here. So this is also the standard loss that we place on the 3D bounding box, on the anchor box, as well as the regression of the uh, of the adjustment on the, the uh, bounding box parameters uh, on the anchor boxes. So our main contribution here is that we add a pre-trained uh, box PC feed uh, network to the main backbone branch over here such that we can actually supervise the transfer of the uh, knowledge from the strong classes to the weak classes. So here, uh, we just, uh, uh, the idea behind this is that we are training this box, uh, box PC network to predict two things. The first output here is that uh, we want it to, given the 3D bounding box, which is the predicted 3D bounding box from the main branch, as well as the input uh, Froston point cloud, which we denote as X over here, we want to first predict the box correction. That means that uh, denoted as delta B over here. That means that we want to uh, predict this delta B 
uh, which we can use to correct the initial prediction that is given to this uh, pre-trained box PC feed network, as well as a uh, probability value over here. So this probability value P over here, it denotes the goodness of feed. This means that given this 3D bounding box, as well as the input 3D point cloud, we want to check whether this probability will tell us whether how good this 3D bounding box is going to be on the input uh, point cloud. So we uh, randomly perturb the strong classes over here the, because we are given the ground truth for the uh, strong classes. We randomly perturb it to be uh, uh, to have a positive uh, probability of the goodness of it and a negative probability on the goodness of it. And we uh, this means that we train it on the classification loss such that if the perturbation is uh, good, it means that the bounding box is a reasonable bounding box for the input point cloud. We'll give it a prob high probability of one. If it is a negative one, we'll suppress it to become uh, zero. As well as the regularization or the regression task over here, where we are going to uh, predict delta, which is our the perturbation that we give to the bounding box on the strong classes. So this is a, a regression, which we uh, simply use a L2 loss over here to predict this uh, delta. So this F box PC regular, uh, uh, regression over here is actually to predict the delta or the uh, delta B over here, uh, which we can use to correct the 3D predicted 3D bounding box. Now, uh, once we have pre-trained this uh, box PC feed network, we'll use it, we'll simply use it in the uh, main branch together with the main branch such that uh, we minimize the or we optimize maximize the goodness of it from the predicted bounding box that is uh, given from the main branch on the weak classes so this uh, is the this particular probability here is actually the uh, probability uh, of the goodness of it from the previous slide as shown here now uh, in order to prevent the, the the wrong prediction from the weak classes or uh, we actually also uh, introduce uh, several regularization losses the first one that we introduce is the relaxed reprojection loss so from the prediction of each of these uh, weak classes we actually reproject it back onto the image because we are also given a 2d image where we apply a 2d detector initially uh, and this green bounding box over here is the output from the, the 2D detector. So the reprojected 3D bounding box over here, we say that it must fall within a certain upper and lower bound between the uh, this particular uh, 2D uh, bounding box that is detected from the 2D detector. And in addition to that, we also make, uh, prevent volume collapse. This, uh, this to make sure that the volume that is predicted from by the uh, the backbone branch over here it doesn't collapse to a singular point and as well as we also prevent large scale uh, de large deviation of the scale of the 3d bounding box that we have uh, predicted so this average uh, scale is actually obtained from you can easily obtain it from some available uh, data which need not be uh, which need not be the, the ground truth uh, label that is corresponding to uh, this respective uh, point cloud that we are given for training. So here's some results uh, on the Sun RGB uh, data where we can see that, uh, so at that time, uh, this Frosten point nets was the only existing work uh, or the few existing work uh, on, on 3D object detection, but it's strongly supervised. We can see that in comparison to the uh, this Frosten point net, which was the state of the art at that time, our uh, box PC feed network actually uh, achieved uh, uh, on a semi-supervised learning level. We actually achieved uh, about eighty percent or seventy to eighty percent of the strongly supervised uh, learning framework, which is considered quite good for a semi-supervised or a non-strongly supervised uh, network at that particular time. And here are some qualitative uh, results which we have shown on the Sun RGBD uh, data. And uh, here we can see that uh, although we use a semi supervision, we can see that we also uh, can uh, detect uh, reasonable results as compared to the fully supervised network of Frosten Point. Net. Here are some results on the uh, KIDI data set. You can also see that uh, we achieve about uh, 
about 70 to 80 percent of the compared to the strongly supervised uh, learning network, which is uh, which was FPN at that at that particular time. And here's some qualitative uh, results which you can see on the detection of cars as well as pedestrians uh, in the KIDI data set as compared to the fully supervised uh, network. We can give some uh, reasonable results over here. So one of the disadvantage uh, limitation here is that we can also observe from here is that the rotation that is estimated from the semi-supervision from our framework, it's uh, less precise compared to the fully supervised uh, framework. This perhaps tell us that it's uh, much more difficult to actually uh, learn the, the rotation of the bounding box without strong supervision. So uh, in our cross-category semi-supervised learning, which we have mentioned in the uh, previous work, is that uh, it's still one disadvantage of it is that it still requires a large amount of uh, 3D data for the strong classes. And furthermore, our method of the cross-category semi-supervised learning on RGBD data, it relies on 2D detector as the input. So the question here is that, the obvious question here is that, can we actually uh, do better? The answer is actually yes. So we uh, tried what is known as the in-category semi-supervised learning on only 3D point clouds as the input. So in category semi supervised learning compared to cross category semi supervised learning is that in this particular case here, for every class of the object that we are interested in detecting, we will give a few sample uh, compared to a cross category where uh, we only give uh, we give a lot of samples for the strong classes and we don't give any samples uh, training samples for the weak classes. And uh, here we propose our work, uh, which we call uh, SES. It stands for Cells Ensembling uh, Semi-Supervised 3D Object Detection, which was uh, published in CBPR uh, this year. This work was done by my uh, student, uh, Zhao Na, over here. And uh, our SES architecture is based on uh, what we call the mean teacher framework. So basically, there are two branches in this particular framework. One is the student branch and one is the teacher branch. So the student branch will actually uh, will actually transfer the knowledge to the teacher using what we call the uh, exponential moving average. So the first step to this uh, SAS network is that we, uh, out of all the labeled and the unlabeled uh, data that we are given, we'll randomly subsample a subset of uh, uh, this uh, data point and input it into our uh, in, into our network. So in the student branch, we will randomly perturb the, the randomly sampled uh, point clouds using a stochastic transform. So this stochastic transform is a random flipping along the x or y axis, or uh, it could also be a random rotation around the upright axis. So once we have uh, applied this transformation on the input point cloud, we'll apply it to we'll input it to the student network. Then the next step would be to uh, use the unperturbed 3D point cloud and input it into the teacher network concurrently. Then uh, we will apply the supervised learning laws uh, on those uh, data points or those uh, point clouds with uh, labels. So here's how we do it. We first apply the same stochastic transform onto the transform labels. And then uh, we will take this uh, transform uh, labels and compare it with the output of the uh, student network. So here it should be self-consistent or, or rather after the transformation, uh, this particular label should be consistent with the output from the student network that uh, is from the input after the stochastic, the same stochastic transformation. Then the next thing that we do would be to uh, get the output from the student network, from the teacher network and apply uh, the same transformation to this uh, output that is obtained from the teacher network. And we apply three consistency losses here between the both the labeled and the unlabeled output uh, of the student and the teacher network uh, respectively. And uh, here we apply three, we propose three consistency losses here. The first loss that we uh, propose is the center aware consistency loss so the idea behind this is that 
we want to minimize the alignment error between the teacher and the student network. So the teacher, where the student network, it's uh, the input point cloud, it's uh, uh, the, where the stochastic transformation is applied to it before the, we input the point cloud into the student network. And in the teacher network, we'll apply the, we'll input the original point cloud into the teacher network and apply the transformation after the, uh, on the outputs of the uh, teacher network. And here we want it, both of the outputs to be self-consistent with each other. And here uh, we simply align this particular center loss here is to align the center of the bounding boxes that is predicted uh, from the teacher and the uh, student network. So since this alignment loss is not uh, bijective, uh, we will have two terms over here where CS, uh, C, CT or CSA here is actually uh, for every uh, bounding box that is predicted from the teacher network, we find the closest uh, center of the, from the, uh, of the bounding box from the student network over here. The second loss that we apply here would be the class aware uh, consistency loss where we want the closest aligned uh, the bounding boxes predicted by the student and the teacher network to also predict the same class. Hence, we minimize the KL divergence between the probabilities of the student and the teacher network that is aligned in the previous uh, loss. The next uh, and the last uh, consistency loss that we apply to the network would be what we call the uh, size aware consistency uh, loss. So here, we want the bounding boxes uh, that is, or the size of the bounding boxes that is predicted by the student and the teacher network to be aligned to each other, to be the same size uh, as each other. And here we will simply uh, minimize the uh, square loss uh, between the two sizes uh, predicted by the closest uh, student uh, bounding box uh, from the student network and the teacher network. Now. Uh, once we have uh, done all this uh, supervised and the uh, consistency losses, we'll do back propagation to the student network to update the student, the, to update the parameter in the student network. And once this back propagation and the update of the student network is done, we will transfer the knowledge from the student network to the teacher network using the uh, exponential moving average technique over here. So here uh, we'll simply uh, do a moving average of the student uh, parameters and then transfer it to the, use it to update the uh, parameters of the teacher network here. Now, here's the uh, results of our SAS, uh, comparing it with the fully supervised uh, learning method, which is the uh, vote net uh, at that time. And uh, this is uh, the, also our backbone network that we use in, the, uh, in our semi-supervised learning technique. So uh, where the blue bars over here represents the performance from the strongly supervised learning technique and the red bars over here represents the increment uh, in the performance from our uh, technique compared to the existing uh, fully supervised technique. So we can see that uh, with all the percentage of the data that we give to our semi-supervised learning technique, we outperform the strongly supervised one in all aspects. And what's interesting here is that uh, with only 50% labor available to our uh, semi-supervised learning network, we can already reach uh, similar performance with the 100% strongly supervised uh, uh, learning uh, uh, backbone network of uh, this uh, boat net over here. And here's some uh, qualitative uh, results on the Sun RGBD data set. We can see that compared to the 100% uh, uh, fully supervised uh, training network, we can obtain reasonable results over here. And here's some qualitative results on uh, ScanNet. We can again see that even with 30% labor on our data set, we can achieve uh, comparable results with the 100% uh, trained or, or the, the strongly supervised uh, trained uh, vote net as our uh, comparison. Now, uh, the second task that we work on is the uh, what we call the 3D key point uh, detection network. And uh, I will talk about the two uh, works, our two previous work that was published in 
uh, ECCV 2018 and ICCV uh, 2019. So it's well known in the computer vision community that uh, key point detector and uh, key point uh, descriptor works very well on uh, image images, uh, even with handcrafted features. So SIFT is actually one of the most well-known uh, key point detector and key point descriptor. Uh, and this allow us to find uh, correspondences between two images taken from different uh, viewpoint. And we all know that this is a very important step towards uh, many uh, computer vision or 3D computer vision related tasks, such as structure for motion, post estimation, and uh, many more other tasks in 3D computer vision. Now, the question is that uh, given two uh, point clouds that are taken from different viewpoints, can we also do the same thing? Because this is also uh, very important for point cloud based registration, such that we can actually take different scans and align them together to form the uh, scan of a 3D model or even the environment. And this actually uh, turns out to be kind of a difficult problem because of the lack of uh, strong labors to get uh, deep learning to actually work well on this particular task. So uh, it's actually kind of uh, challenging. Suppose that we are given all these point clouds without the ground truth labors over here even for human labelers, how am I going to tell which are the key points over here that are important or salient uh, and remains invariant uh, throughout the different viewpoint changes or different scene uh, perturbation, for example. So uh, we mitigate this particular problem by proposing the weekly supervised uh, 3D feed net. This was a work, uh, work done by my student, Zijian, uh, here, and it was published in ECCV uh, 2018. So the solution to mitigate the, the need for strong labels for key points detectors, uh, which are very challenging to obtain, is to use uh, what we call the weak labels. So weak labels here simply refer to the approximate GPS or INS location of each point cloud, uh, denoted as point uh, PI here. So the point cloud here could be a segment of the point cloud uh, from the a scene as shown in this, this diagram here. So in order to fully utilize this in our weekly supervised uh, learning framework, we will first form a uh, training purpose over here, where we define the anchor point cloud here to be any randomly chosen segment of point clouds from the scene. So imagine that I mount a laser sensor or a scanner on my car and then I go around the city to uh, collect these point clouds and use the GPS INS uh, to actually align them together to form uh, the home map or the 3D model of the city. And now I've segmented into many different uh, small segments that look something like this. So I just need to randomly choose one segment and call it uh, the anchor point cloud. And then I have to also form uh, uh, the positive point cloud to this anchor point cloud. So the positive point cloud, it could be a point cloud that is taken from another time Y, for example. And here, it is actually strongly encouraged that this positive point cloud to be taken from another time because we also want to take into account, we want our network to learn the variation in the scene uh, over time. And But in this case here, the positive point clouds, it would have to be taken roughly at the same location as our anchor point cloud. So this can be uh, given by the GPS INS location and it need not be exactly the same location. In fact, uh, the, the, uh, this particular location over here, it has to have some errors given by the GPS and INS, INS location. We also want our network to be uh, robust against such error. And the next thing that we define would be a negative point cloud, which is a, a point cloud segment taken from a different time uh, at a different location from the anchor point cloud. This different location can be given by the GPS and INS uh, readings. Now, this is a, a network architecture of our 3D feed net. The first step that we do would be to, uh, given all these uh, three, uh, the tuples of the point clouds, the first step that we are doing would be to uh, do clustering on the uh, input point cloud with what we call the iterative furthest point. So these are the, we sample for 
representative points from the input point clouds. And then the next thing that we do would be to pass these clusters that we sampled from iterative uh, furthest point into the detector network. So here, the detector network would output uh, two things. The first thing, uh, it would be attention weight. And the second thing that it outputs would be uh, orientation. So this orientation is important because uh, we all, all the point clouds, it might can be coming from uh, in a form of different orientation. And this orientation is actually to uh, undo this orientation and change it into all the point clouds, change it into the uh, canonical rotation such that we can actually extract a district, descriptor, which we can uh, compare them directly. And uh, of course, we'll pass this uh, orientation that we have uh, estimated from the detector network, as well as the input point clouds, uh, the cluster that we have sampled from the iterative furthest point into the descriptor network. And this will output the, the descriptor. This is essentially a vector uh, which uh, describes our key point that is detected from the first step. Then finally, uh, we have put all this into our alignment uh, triplet loss. So basically here, uh, for every key point that is detected and every descriptor that is detected from my anchor point cloud, I want to find the closest uh, match of the descriptor from my uh, positive point cloud. So this is given by this minimal uh, uh, this this particular vector over here and then essentially I want to minimize the total uh, sum of all these minimal distances because I want the key point the descriptors from the uh, positive point cloud to be as close to the anchor point cloud as possible we'll do the same thing uh, for the positive for the negative and the anchor uh, point cloud pair we'll uh, also find the minimum match over here the best match over here but now, instead of uh, minimizing these distances, we want to maximize this, this distance in our triplet loss. The reason is because we want to force the anchor point cloud to be as far away from the negative point cloud as possible. And then uh, we'll weigh this uh, triplet loss with our the, the weights that we have learned, the attention weight that we have learned from the detector uh, the module over here. So essentially what this means is that the more salient the feature will give it a higher weight and the, some of the uh, non-salient feature or the non-useful features will give it a lower weight uh, that is predicted from the network such that it will suppress this particular loss over here. Here's a, a comparison of our results uh, from some of the existing uh, the, some of the existing techniques and in fact during that time most of the existing techniques are handcrafted technique on uh, 3D key point detector and de descriptor. We can see that we outperform all the rest of the techniques uh, in this graph over here. And what's interesting here is that comparing to the ISS key point, which was the state of the art uh, handcrafted feature uh, key point detector at that time, we can see that uh, our 3D feed net actually ignores a lot of uh, non salient key points that can be found on the ground. These are non discriminative key points. Whereas ISS actually uh, falsely detected all these key points to be useful key points. Now, here's a comparison on the Oxford robot uh, car data set with existing techniques. You can see that we outperform all the other techniques. And we also do the same on the Kitty automatry uh, data set. And we also outperform all the rest of the uh, techniques over here. Here's a, a test of our key point detector, our 3D feed net key point detector on to find correspondences between uh, two different uh, point clouds where we actually use it for registrations afterwards. So we can, uh, the red lines over here uh, represents the key points that the uh, correspondences that is detected from our uh, 3D feed net. And then uh, this uh, figure over here, uh, it represents after we perform ICP, for example, on, the, uh, on these correspondences, we can uh, successfully register these uh, point clouds together. And we can see that uh, uh, our technique actually achieves a better registration compared to the available or the existing handcrafted uh, techniques of ISS plus the FPFH uh, descriptor uh, th that was available at that time. So uh, in 3D FeedNet, we talk about 
using weekly supervised learning where we still require uh, some form of weak labels. And in that case, it's actually the GPS and INS uh, reading. And uh, very often this GPS and INS reading would require expensive setup to actually, uh, you need to mount this uh, GPS and INS sensor on your vehicle. And these are expensive setup that not many people can actually uh, afford to get it. So the question here is that, can we actually do better than uh, weak supervision? So instead of uh, uh, instead of using any labels over here, and the goal uh, is to still the same thing, which we want to detect highly repeatable and accurately localized key points from the uh, 3D point clouds without any use of ground truth training data, not even the GPS and INS uh, reading in the form of the weak supervision. So here uh, we propose what is called the unsupervised uh, stable interest uh, key point detector, or in short, uh, the UCIP, which was uh, done by my ex student, uh, Jia Xing, over here. And in this case, uh, we totally do without any form of labeling, not even a weak uh, form of labeling. So uh, in this case here, we actually use what we call the self supervision uh, in order to for the network to learn how to detect uh, salient key points or useful key points here. Now, the key idea behind uh, use it is actually uh, very si simple. So given a point cloud, uh, any point cloud object uh, that is shown here, denoted by X over here, we'll first uh, input this particular point cloud into our feature proposal network. And the output of this would be a set of key points on the input point cloud that is given to the feature proposal network. So concurrently, we will also uh, randomly perturb this or randomly transform this input point cloud X by a randomly uh, generated transformation in the SE3 space into X tilde over here. And then we'll put this particular uh, randomly perturb uh, point cloud into the FPN as well. And this will give us a set of uh, key points uh, in this, uh, 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 from the outputs of the our, our network over here. Then the next thing that we will do is that we will undo this particular transformation on the set of uh, detected key points from the randomly uh, transformed uh, input point cloud, uh, X tilde. And here, uh, what's uh, interesting here is that uh, because these are the same point and we are same object over here, and we know that uh, we randomly uh, transform it using some form of uh, SE3 transformation. We can actually undo this transformation on the detected key points over here. And uh, the, un the key points that is uh, uh, after the undoing of this transformation, it should match up with the key points that is detected from the original input point cloud over here. So we are introduced two losses uh, in order to supervise this particular uh, network. Now, a straightforward uh, way to minimize the difference between the uh, detected key points before and after the transformation is simply to use what we call the chamfer loss. And uh, however, the problem with this uh, chamfer loss is that uh, it actually gives equal saliency or equal weightage to all the point clouds. But in our case here, because we are talking about key point detector, so some of the key points that is detected by our network might not be equally salient compared to the others, or might not be equally useful and dis discriminative compared to the, the others. So here, what it means is that the chamfer loss is not, is, uh, not so ideal in uh, handling such cases. So uh, in order to overcome this uh, problem, we introduce what is known as the uh, probabilistic chamfer loss, where uh, we, in addition to the key point detector from our feature proposal network, for every key point that is detected, we also add in uh, uh, some variance. Uh, a variance. This variance over here simply tell us the uncertainty of the key points that we are uh, that is detected from our feature proposal. Uh, network from the input point cloud. And we'll model this uncertainty or this particular distribution using exponential uh, distribution between the you know, detected key points 
uh, from the original input point cloud and the point cloud after the transformation. And this leads to uh, what we call the probabilistic uh, chamfer loss. So uh, intuitively, we can think of it this way that the sigma over here, the uncertainty over here, is to actually uh, weigh the, the or to balance the, the chamfer loss between how certain uh, we are for a given uh, detected key point. Now, uh, it's not just sufficient to uh, enforce the probabilistic chamfer loss, because in this particular case here in our UCIP, in comparison to our previous work on uh, 3D feed net, where uh, if you still recall that the, in the 3D feed net, we actually enforce the key points to be in the point cloud. This means that the key point, because of the randomly sampled, uh, the randomly sampled points from the IPS, uh, from the iterative uh, IFS, from the iterative uh, furthest point uh, sampling, and in this case, uh, the key points are actually subjected to a certain uh, quantization error, but uh, and this is not good. So this would lead to a drop in the uh, performance. So in order to overcome this problem, uh, in the in our UCIP here, we avoid the sampling from the point cloud, the input point cloud directly, and we allow the our feature proposal network to predict any key points anywhere in the 3D space. But uh, after we relax this uh, choice, uh, what will happen is that the key point that is predicted from our FPS might be too far away from the input point cloud, the surface of the input point cloud. So in order to overcome this, we introduce the point to point loss that uh, penalize any key point that is detected from our feature proposal network to be too far away from the uh, input point cloud. Now here's uh, the qualitative uh, results to show you uh, with and without the point to point loss. We can see that without the point to point loss, uh, the network tends to predict key points that are floating in the air over here. But with the point to point loss, we can see that uh, the key points that is detected uh, tend to be on the point given input point cloud. Here, uh, here are some experimental results that we have uh, performed on four open source data set, Kitty, Oxford data set, the Redwood, as well as the modern net 40 data set. We evaluate on uh, two evaluation criteria, the repeatability, as well as the distinctiveness of the uh, key points. So here's some plots that uh, we show on the four data uh, sets here. Uh, and we can see that uh, our use it uh, significantly outperform uh, all the existing techniques, including uh, 3D feed net on all these four data sets. And here's uh, the, the some uh, results on the registration failure, as we have uh, shown in the, the 3D feed net. We can see that uh, UCIP uh, has a lowest rate of a uh, percentage of failure uh, in the registration compared to all the other existing techniques. And interestingly, uh, UCIP also outperforms uh, 3D feed net which already has uh, a, uh, quite a low uh, registration failure rate over here. Now, the, uh, the next thing that I'm going to talk about, the next task that I'm going to talk about is the 3D semantic segmentation task. So where we, are, we actually published this work in uh, CVPR uh, this year. So, 3D segmentation or 3D semantic segmentation task uh, widely encompasses uh, two uh, different subtasks, where the first one would be what we call the 3D uh, shape segmentation. And uh, this uh, particular task over here is that given a point cloud of a shape, of an object, of a 3D object model that looks something like this. For example, in this case here, uh, this is a chair. Uh, the task is that we want to uh, segment this input 3D point cloud of the object into the different semantic parts. So this could be the backrest, this could be the seat, and this could be the uh, legs of the uh, input point cloud over here. And uh, similarly, you can have many other uh, different objects. What we want to do here would be to segment them into different uh, semantically meaningful parts from the 3D shape. And this would usually require uh, 1,000 points to about 10,000 points uh, labels. 
uh, to for the strongly supervised uh, learning network to work well. And the second task that uh, the second subtask of 3D semantic segmentation would be what we call the uh, three door uh, 3D indoor scene segmentation. Uh, it could also be outdoor, but in the in this case here, we only tried it on the indoor scene. And uh, so in this case, what we are given would be the 3D point cloud of the whole scene instead of an object compared to the previous subtask here. So now we are given this uh, 3D point clouds of the whole scene. The next thing that we want to do is that uh, we want to assign labels, semantic labels to every point cloud, to every input point cloud, such that uh, we know the semantic meaning or the semantic classes of each one of these point cloud in the uh, real scene. For example, here where we are given a scene in the pantry, uh, what we want to do here is that for every point from the input point cloud, we want to assign a label on whether this is a this belongs to a wall, this belongs to a ceiling or the ground or any other objects that is in the scene. And typically, because uh, the 3D scene segmentation involves the whole scene, the number of points that we are uh, given it's a uh, actually increase drastically compared to the 3D object uh, detection, uh, 3D object semantic uh, uh, segmentation task. And in this case here, the number of points that we usually require or la labels that we require would be to on uh, the order of millions of points. And in both these tasks, it's actually very uh, challenging for any manual labeling to take place. Because imagine that you are given this point cloud uh, or any point cloud on the object level. Uh, what we want to do here is that we want to label every single point in this uh, 10,000 points or a million points to take one out of K classes. Uh, and this is uh, uh, pretty much challenging to do. So in order to uh, resolve this particular challenge here in the uh, tedious labeling of every single point in the point cloud for semantic segmentation. We propose the weekly supervised uh, semantic point cloud segmentation. And what we showed in this particular uh, work here is that interestingly, even with as low as one point uh, label per class in the 3D point cloud, we can actually show uh, comparable performance to 100% uh, fully supervised learning uh, network here. And uh, here's uh, the architecture of our weekly supervised uh, 3D semantic segmentation uh, work. So it contains, uh, it consists of four different branches over here. The first branch is what we call the incomplete supervision branch. Given uh, the point cloud, uh, what we, we train a network to extract the features and uh, to transform this into a the set of point embeddings. So there's one embedding per point per uh, in the n number of uh, point clouds over uh, n number of points in the point clouds. Then the next thing to do here is that uh, we will apply softmax cross entropy on all the uh, points with available labels. So because this is a weekly supervised uh, learning, we are given a very few points uh, which is labeled in the point cloud. So we'll apply this on the, the uh, using the soft max cross entropy loss, where M over here is the mask to tell us whether the strong labels exist for that particular point or not. And the second branch that we uh, use to uh, weekly supervise our network is what we call the Siamese branch. So essentially what this means is that given that particular point cloud, I will first uh, extract the point embedding for this uh, original point cloud. And then I will subject this uh, input point cloud to a certain uh, rotation or mirroring around the x, y uh, axis. And then uh, I'm going to input this into the same encoder network. And essentially, uh, this is just equivalent to data augmentation and randomly perturbing the input point cloud with some form of transformation. But uh, since they are the same point cloud, the features that is being extracted from these uh, two different point clouds, uh, they are going to be the same. So we are use the L2 distance to measure the divergence and minimize this divergence, minimize the differences between the uh, features that is extracted from these two uh, sets of point clouds. The third uh, supervision branch or, uh, is what we call the inexact uh, supervision branch. 
So this branch here, the supervision is inspired by what we call the multi-instance labeling, uh, uh, which is a very common uh, technique used in uh, weak supervision for image-based uh, segmentation or object detection task. And here, essentially what here it means is that instead of uh, labeling, instead of uh, having a task to label every single point in our input point cloud to belong to one out of K classes, we say that uh, we are going to uh, label, we are going to train a classifier such that it tells us uh, the point cloud wise or the point clouds level uh, classification, whether in this particular input point cloud, it contains that part, it contains a table, a ceiling, for example, and this would be the, the point cloud level uh, supervision. So in this case, we do not need every point to be labeled. We just need a, a subset of the points or a, a very small number of the points uh, in each class to be uh, to, to have an available label. So we will apply uh, softmax on this uh, or, or the uh, max pooling, sorry, on the available data, on the available ground truth data. And then we will train the network such that it outputs the uh, point clockwise labeling uh, compared to the this uh, particular uh, ground truth labels that we are that we have obtained from uh, max pooling now the fourth branch that we have would be uh, the smoothness branch here so essentially uh, what this uh, what we want to achieve on the smoothness branch is that we want to uh, the for any two points which are neighboring points spatially arranged in uh, spatially they are very close together we want to encourage them to take the same label. So here, that's why we uh, say that if there are neighboring points, uh, which is uh, closest to uh, near, we uh, detect this, use, compute this using the nearest neighboring uh, or the K, uh, the, the K nearest K nearest neighbor algorithm. Uh, and we want to enforce them to be smooth, uh, to take the same label. And in addition to that, we also want to encourage the uh, two points with the same color if we are given the this information during training we also want to and uh, encourage them to take the same label if they have the same color over here now here's the uh, experimental results uh, which we evaluate on the shape net data set for the uh, 3d shape segmentation uh, problem and we can see that uh, comparing this with the uh, where we use the encoder of uh, point net plus plus compared to full supervision here, uh, even with one point weak supervision, this means that every part in the input point cloud, we are only given one point. We can actually achieve uh, comparable results to the fully supervised setting over here. And uh, with as low as uh, even 10%, we can actually uh, uh, improve the results by uh, quite a bit over here. And uh, here, we also test it on uh, our network on the uh, partnet data set. This is a new data set at that time. And uh, we can see that comparing to the full supervision, uh, even with 10% uh, uh, labeled data, as uh, we, our network already achieved kind of a close performance to the fully supervised uh, learning network. And here's some qualitative results on the 3D, uh, S, 3D IS uh, scene segmentation. So essentially, uh, this uh, is given the point cloud of a scene, we want to label every point to take a certain class over here. And uh, here, in uh, we also show some results, qualitative results on the uh, shape net part segmentation. We can see that uh, in, our, in our case over here, uh, we, even with one point supervision, we already reach some uh, close, we already reach results that are very close to the ground truth uh, qualitatively over here. Now, uh, I'm going uh, talk, to talk about the last task that we are uh, working on, the, which is the 3D human pose estimation. Uh, which we apply uh, weak supervision uh, on a gener to design a generative network for multiple uh, 3D human pose estimation. So uh, for 3D human pose estimation, it's a very challenging uh, problem. So essentially what we want to do here is that 
given a 2D image, we want to uh, leave this 2D image which contains a human inside there. And we want to leave this uh, 2D uh, the skeleton pose of the human into the 3D uh, structure or the 3D pose of the human that is uh, seen in this particular image. And we know that this is actually a very ill pose uh, problem because uh, ill pose meaning that because uh, from 3D, when we project to 2D, we all know that the depth is missing. Uh, and this is a non-invertible uh, projection which means that uh, from 2D, given 2D, to retrieve or to recover the 3D structure, uh, this uh, we are missing a lot of information uh, from here. And in addition to being a ill post problem, this is also a inverse uh, problem where because of the ambiguity in the depth. So, so suppose, uh, for example, this particular point that we see on the 2D image over here, the 3D uh, counterpart could actually lie anywhere on this light ray over here. So this is actually uh, what we refer to as an inverse problem. So uh, what it means here is that uh, there could be more than one feasible solution uh, to this uh, particular problem of lifting 2D to 3D uh, human pose. And uh, in our previous work here, uh, we show that uh, we can actually uh, mitigate this problem by instead of uh, estimating, getting the network to estimate one single uh, 3D human pose estimation, which will uh, can easily overfit to the training data. We make use of what we call the mixture density network to estimate multiple uh, 3D human poses from a single image over here. So we can see that uh, in this case here, uh, in our uh, mixture density network, we actually estimate five hypotheses per uh, input image, and uh, with, where all of them actually reprojects to almost the same uh, 2D uh, reprojections, which shows that the inverse problem actually exists. However, this existing work that we uh, uh, proposed in uh, CVPR 2019 last year uh, is uh, strongly supervised. So, what this means is that during training, we are still require uh, the training data with 2D to 3D uh, correspondences. This means that for every image that we are given, we need to have the corresponding uh, 3D ground truth that, uh, is, uh, uh, that uh, it's often very difficult to label. So in this uh, recent work, we mitigate the problem uh, the, of the availability of the uh, strong labeled data with uh, weak supervision. And we, uh, but at the same time, we also want to our network to be able to generate the multiple uh, 3D human pose hypothesis in order to overcome the inverse uh, problem, which I have described earlier. So this work was uh, published in BMVC this year, and it was uh, done by my student uh, Li Chen, as shown here. So uh, the rough idea here is that we want to train a model a uh, generative model, which we call Q here, to generate multiple samples of the 3D uh, pose hypothesis, uh, and uh, where we are conditioned upon that we are given the input 2D uh, image of the or 2D skeleton pose of the human, and a, a random vector, a random latent code uh, Z, which we actually draw from a normal distribution uh, over here. And uh, given these two as the input, we want our generator network here to output the uh, 3D human pose or to output multiple uh, uh, 3D human poses. Each one of them correspond to a unique uh, uh, random sample that we draw from the normal distribution. Now, the uh, this is the network ar architecture of, to achieve this particular task here. The first loss that we uh, and fourth would be the 2D reprojection loss. So given the input 2D uh, human skeleton, as well as a random code that we draw from the normal distribution, uh, we want to train this generator here to output Y, which is the uh, 3D human pose estimation. And we will also concurrently at the same time estimate the camera uh, projection matrix, which we call M over here from the input uh, to the skeleton uh, pose as well as the image. 
And then uh, we will apply this camera projection matrix on the estimated 3D uh, skeleton pose and to reproject it onto the 2D image, which we will compare it with the input uh, 2D skeleton pose. So we want these two to be minimized. This means that all the reprojection or all, all the estimated 3D poses that we have, it should be consistent with the input 2D poses uh, when it's reprojected onto that the image plane. Now, uh, in order to encourage our generative network to uh, give very diverse pose hypothesis, we also enforce the uh, uh, regularization of the diverse pose hypothesis uh, losses over here where uh, this loss, uh, we will maximize this particular loss over here, uh, where it simply says that uh, given two random vectors that is drawn from the normal distribution here, we want the pose to, that is estimated from, or that is generated from our pose generator from these two uh, different random uh, codes over here to be as diverse as possible. We don't want it to be uh, similar. We want to maximize the differences between the post that is generated by these two generator, uh, uh, the these two input latent codes from the post generator. So this, as a result, you will enforce diversity uh, in our uh, generative network here. Then the next thing uh, we will also want to prevent mode collapse in our uh, generative network by enforcing what we call the reconstruction loss. So essentially, uh, what this means here is that we want to prevent many to one mapping. So we want to enforce one to one mapping over here, in other words, uh, which means that we want to minimize the difference between the latent code that we have drawn and the invert in and the inversion of the output from the post generator, which is uh, denoted as G here. Uh, we pass it through an encoder to invert this uh, output in back into the uh, latent code. And we want these two latent code to be as close to each other as possible. This actually enforces one-to-one -one mapping uh, from the latent code to the output of our uh, post generator network. Then finally, uh, we apply the adversarial loss, which is in this case here, it's actually a maximum uh, mean discrepancy loss uh, where uh, this loss actually uh, try to minimize the expected mean of the from the from the samples p and q that uh, from our real and generated uh, distribution respectively so this enforce the two distribution the two output distribution uh, from our post generator and a set of samples that we are given of the real poses to be as close to each other as possible now here are some uh, results on the uh, human 3.6 M data set, where we can see that, uh, uh, here, so here zero, uh, ZC over here uh, represents zero coding. This means that we actually get the best hypothesis from our generator network by sampling from the, Z, uh, by taking the sample, drawing a, a sample of Z from the, that corresponds to the maximum peak of the normal distribution, which we call the zero coding. and. Uh, we can see that it uh, achieved uh, uh, quite a, a good performance. It actually outperforms the, the uh, state-of-the-art uh, weekly supervised, uh, but this is uh, state-of-the-art, uh, but this particular work is, uh, it doesn't consist of, uh, it doesn't output multiple hypotheses. Uh, we can see that we actually outperformed uh, this particular network over here by quite a, a huge margin. And uh, we can also see that we uh, can apply mean shift to get the uh, on all the samples that is drawn from our network to get the best post hypothesis. And this achieves a, a even better result on protocol one for the human 3.6 M data set. And on protocol two, we can see that uh, uh, we our result is uh, comparable or it's actually, uh, it is actually better than the existing uh, weekly supervised uh, networks that is uh, on protocol two over here. Here's some other results that we perform on the MPI in uh, 3D PH uh, P uh, data set as well as the MP2 data set. So in this case here, we can see that uh, our network actually uh, gives 
uh, comparable results to the weekly supervised network on the percentage correct key points, uh, otherwise known as the PCK uh, measure over here. And here's some qualitative result on the MP2 uh, data set that we can see that uh, our the 3D human post that is estimated from our network is a uh, it, it's actually reasonable uh, given all these 2D uh, images as the input. So in conclusion, uh, I have talked about the several tasks where we can actually apply uh, weak or, or non strongly supervised learning uh, to get uh, promising results. So, uh, but however, one thing that I wish to emphasize is that uh, this non strongly supervised learning thing is still far from being solved because we can see that uh, a lot of the tasks that I have uh, shown on uh, on the three D uh, learning. Uh, we still cannot reach comparable performance or even outperform the strong supervision. So uh, here, the conclusion is that there is still a long way to go. And I hope that uh, the community will actually uh, look or place more emphasis on this particular line of work. So such that we uh, hope that we can see very promising results or even uh, very good results compared to the strong supervised learning in the future. Okay, uh, that's all for my talk. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Gimhee, for that uh, very interesting talk. Um, so for those of you guys who joined uh, midway into the stream, uh, we saw a lot of different tasks in 3D computer vision, uh, 3D object detection, uh, key point detection, semantic segmentation, and also human pose estimation. And um, under these different tasks, uh, Gimhee, presented uh, several works and methods that can be learned without strong forms of supervision, but still perform quite competitively, both to other uh, non-strong, strongly supervised works, and also sometimes even uh, perform almost competitively to uh, supervised, uh, strongly supervised works. Um, so I would like to uh, open up the, so actually the chat is already open. So if you guys have uh, questions for Gimhi, I would be happy to, uh, to, uh, to have a Q&A session now. Um, so to start with, we already have one question here. Uh, give me, so um, mm -hmm. from Kai who asks, um, for your work on 3D segmentation, um, is it because of the connectivity uh, information and also the idea of having homogeneous 3D structures that it's possible to use only one labeled uh, point per class to achieve the performance that you do? Yes, I think that's the... Uh, uh... That's a very good insight here. The, the answer is actually yes, uh, because in 3D structures, you get this, uh, you get the X, Y, Z coordinate, which can actually give very strong information of the discontinuity or uh, some form of uh, sh the, the shape information of that particular uh, 3D object or, or the scene. So this actually helps very strongly in uh, regularizing the, the 3D segmentation result compared to 2D image segmentation, where everything lies on a plane. So in the image, you don't get this kind of information there. Yeah. Um, okay, so while we're waiting maybe for some other questions from the audience, I have a few questions of my own also. Um, so maybe let's start with something more general. Um, so. I mean, we've also seen, uh, let's say, machine learning methods uh, applied in computer vision, which also use other forms of, which do not rely on uh, strong forms of supervision for many other tasks as well. So do you think that this, uh, the success of these methods now has something to do with um, the fact that our current uh, machine learning algorithms are not really able to fully leverage this entire set of data? Or do you think there's something inherent within within uh, 3D data itself that uh, you're presenting that uh, attribute that you can attribute the success of your methods to? So as I think the the main thing that if you have noticed several of the works actually follows the same almost the same trick that we are using we are leveraging on the 3D transformation here, mm -hmm. which is actually missing in 2D. Actually, I would say that it's more difficult to do on uh, 2D. Because the transformation in 3D is just in living in the SE3 space. So we can actually very precisely uh, 
after the perturbation, after the random transformation in the SE3 space, we can make use of this information to enforce the consistency. But in the 2D space, uh, what we are subjected to would be a general uh, transformation in terms of uh, in the homography space. And this is actually very ill constrained. So we don't know how that whole thing is projected because of the different views, right? So uh, in 2D, I think that uh, although there are many uh, techniques that are uh, already shown some level of success there, uh, generally these parts here is, uh, I mean, this constraint that uh, we use in the 3D uh, non-strongly supervised learning techniques uh, is not applicable to uh, the 2D case. And I would say that much of the success that we seen from it on the 3D task is actually coming from this particular constraint. So we should all be working more in 3D rather than 2D then, right? Uh, that's a that's a good question. I think I don't I actually don't think so because the, some of the things that we are working on, for, for example, the 3D human pose estimation, right? We're actually doing a two stage. Uh, estimation. If you have noticed that the input to this is actually the 2D detection. Yeah. So that's uh, the importance of the, I mean, the uh, important part of the, the 2D detection. Right? And I think that there could also be way to leverage on uh, the outputs of 2D detection uh, or any uh, 2D task. For example, you can first do 2D semantic segmentation and perhaps fuse it together with uh, the 3D semantic segmentation task uh, on the RGBD data, for example. And even for our the first work that I've mentioned, uh, although it's 3D object detection, it's on RGBD data, you can see that it actually uh, depends hugely on the first step where on, on the input of the 2D object detector, which is actually from a 2D classifier or 2D object detector. Right? Okay. So uh, it's still important. I wouldn't say that it's not important. I see, I see. Uh, so Alberto asks um, if you have any thoughts on uh, working with meshes without strong supervision. Uh, working on meshes, yes. I think that uh, this would probably have the same concept as uh, 3D point cloud, except for we just need to reparameterize the, the input and the output uh, space according to the meshes instead of what we are using right now, uh, which is a point cloud, which is actually simpler to model. But I suspect that uh, in the mesh space, you might have more constraints over there because uh, the of, you can actually apply the regularization on the meshes better than uh, treating every single point in the 3D representation independently, which is actually what we are doing right now. I see. Um, does that mean then that you think we need some better data structures to give some in-between representation between fully independent uh, 3D points, which is the case of point clouds versus uh, meshes, which uh, we already have linked all of these points together as ver with vertices? Yes, I think uh, that's a good question. I think that uh, this is true, but th there's always a trade-off, right? I mean, uh, treating everything independently as what we are doing right now in the point cloud. Uh, this actually uh, reduces the computation complexity or the complexity in terms of the whole algorithm or for the whole network design. Uh, but uh, the trade-off is that you might end up with less constraints and uh, leading to a drop of performance. But if you, of course, there's nothing stopping us from designing data structures that is super complicated, such as meshes or some other uh, form of representation of the 3D surfaces. But the question is that uh, when, when you have such a complicated uh, parameterization of the input and output space, your network would also have to be uh, consequently more complicated in order to uh, be able to handle this kind of uh, 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 computerization, right? So I don't know, like uh, this might actually lead to uh, uh, more computation and more complex design. So there's a trade-off. So which one do you want? Uh, the more compli more complicated uh, design, more complex uh, uh, computation, or a uh, 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 better performance. So we we will have to choose one. Right? I mean, 
uh, we have to balance between these two. I see, I see. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a couple more questions that popped up. Uh, so from Kai, who asks again, he's asking if uh, maybe this is even a little bit more controversial. Do you think 3D pose estimation is uh, outperforming 2D pose estimation because there's no occlusion, so to say? This is a, this is a interesting question. I, I wouldn't want to uh, draw a conclusion here, but from what I observed in the past few years, right? I mean, at least in the community, 2D estimation or a single human 2D estimation, uh, it seems to be pretty much saturated. So I don't see any uh, fancy new work, at least in the past three years or four years, right? Uh, but there are many work in the uh, 3D human pose estimation. But I don't know whether is this due to the case of whether uh, the performance that generally in the community, everyone is very satisfied with the current state of the art performance for 2D estimation, which uh, implies that this might be a fully solved problem. I, I don't know whether is this true or not, but the, the case, uh, the situation that we are observing right now is that there are very few work or I would say that almost there's no new work in the past uh, few years on 2D post estimation, but there are quite a number of works on 3D uh, post estimation. And in fact, one observation uh, for the 3D human post estimation is that uh, quite a number of work in the past few years actually focus on non-strong supervision. So uh, this could also mean that people uh, start to identify that uh, or start to acknowledge that uh, although the good results from deep learning, uh, it, it's actually largely attributed to the fact that they are all learning from a huge amount of data, which might not be easily accessible. Yeah. Well, I was just going to comment on this question. I mean, I don't know this idea of having no occlusion. I'm, I guess this is depending on whether you see it as occlusion from the uh, observation or from the actual model, right? So from an observation point of view, where especially in uh, the human post estimation, often the uh, the input data is monocular, right? So there is still occlusion in that sense. It's just yeah, so the the occlusion because what we are trying to do here is to leave two D to three D, right? So the occlusion is still there. I mean, okay. I wouldn't. That's why I wouldn't say that uh, it's due to the occlusion. I mean. Uh, unless you are talking about uh, like given the the but even with ground truth occlusion is still going to be a problem because ultimately what we want to train the network to learn is uh, from a 2d image which might already contain some occlusion to actually infer the 3d structure so actually 3d post estimation with occlusion on 2d images is much more challenging than to uh, do 2d detection on 2D images with occlusion. Because in that case, right, in the 2D case, we can actually just omit out the 2D uh, joints that we are interested in detecting if it is occluded, right? But in 3D, uh, I think it's uh, going to be kind of challenging if you are, uh, let's say your joint is occluded in the 2D input space, in, in 2D uh, input image. And what you want to do is that you want to actually predict the three corresponding uh, 3D join from nothing, from uh, given that you have, uh, you don't even see that thing in the 2D image. So this is probably the opposite of what uh, uh, this, uh, this question is uh, trying to uh, say. Uh, I don't think it's uh, because of the occlusion that 3D estimation outperform 2D estimation. Yeah. Okay, uh, so Avanov asks, um if your mixture networks will help uh, in monocular 3D object detection and also RGBD 3D object detection? Oh, that's a that's a good question. Yes, I think, uh, but we haven't really tried this uh, out. So the, uh, I, but I, I would suppose that this uh, is a yes, because mixture density network, if you look at it this way, that it's actually trying to prevent overfitting. Uh, so in the case where we, train the network to output only one uh, particular output, uh, given all the training data set, which tells you that uh, there should be a hard ground truth, that uh, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the input and the output. 
But uh, in the case where uh, we, uh, we are working on uh, images, where we know that there's a projective ambiguity. So uh, we, we know that, the, that there's an inverse problem that exists. So uh, that means that the 3D post or the 3D object uh, location that we are trying to detect from 2D images, it can lie anywhere on this particular uh, light ray. So as long as it's an inverse problem, I think that uh, mixture density network uh, might help a lot here. But in the case of the point cloud, I'm not too sure about that uh, because you would already have the metric uh, scale. That means that uh, we are given the point cloud in the exact uh, scale. So uh, there won't be this ambiguity uh, in the inverse uh, that exists in the inverse problem for a 2D to 3D kind of uh, estimation. Okay, um, so I think we're almost drawing to the uh, the conclusion time of our scheduled stream. So if there are no other questions from our audience, then um, Gimhi, I'd like to thank you again for uh, speaking in our seminar series. And uh, for everybody who is watching right now, I hope you guys tune in next week. We will have another speaker lined up to give another talk. And uh, thank you for joining us. Okay, thank you.